Julie, this touches on uh, perhaps two of the most common questions that people uh, come to you know my stuff about. I put up an article on our website a few years ago, what to do if your wife doesn't want to have sex, and then what to do if your husband doesn't want to have sex. And even a few years later, those are the most visited um, pages. I regularly uh, get husbands, and then we'll talk about wives in a second, but I regularly get husbands who will uh, write to me something like, well, 1 Corinthians 7 says my wife is supposed to give me sex and she's sinning if she's not, some variety wow. of that. Yeah. Um, unpack that for a minute for us, especially with this pillar of sacrificial love. Does God want you to have a good married sex life? Does bringing God into your marriage bedroom make a better sex life? I'm Dr. Carol, and thank you for being with me on this episode. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about God and having a good married sex life. My friend, Dr. Julie Slattery, has been on our program before, and she has been a guest favorite. I am so thrilled that we can have her on again. Dr. Julie Slattery is a clinical psychologist, an author, and a speaker, and president and co-founder of the Authentic Intimacy Organization. She served at Focus on the Family, and then in 2012, uh, formed Authentic Intimacy as a ministry devoted to reclaiming God's design for sexuality. Uh, there's so much I could say about Dr. Julie and Authentic Intimacy authentic intimacy. Uh, she's written 12 books. She has a podcast, Java with Julie. I know some of you, perhaps many of you are familiar with Dr. Julie. What we're talking today uh, with her about today is her latest book, God, Sex, and Your Marriage. And Dr. Julie believes that God wants you to have a good married sex life and that following the pattern is the best way to get there. We'll talk about what that pattern is, and some pillars that go into building a good married sex life. I think you will find this conversation uh, nourishing to your soul, and I know that it can help you have a better married sex life. My friend, Dr. Julie Slattery. Well, Dr. Julie Slattery, welcome again to Relationship Prescriptions with Dr. Carol. You're one of our podcast favorites, so thank you. Oh, well, thank you. It's always a joy to be on. And yeah. it's been great to have you on Job with Julie as well. So it's well, I, anytime. I so enjoy uh, your podcasts. I follow regularly. It's, it's a delight when I have some of our listeners comment on some things that, that you have shared. And today we're talking about marriage. Uh, mm -hmm. Your recent book, God, Sex, and Your Marriage, is a, a, a little bit different than some of the work you've done before. This is for both men and women. It's for married couples they can go through together. And I'm just, I'm just so glad you have addressed this in particular. Yeah, we have heard for many years from women who are like, uh, I'm going through your materials. What do you have for my husband? So we thought it was about time to create something for men and women and for couples to go through together. Yeah. yeah, I've read it. I think it's wonderful. I've listened to some of your conversations uh, around this book, and I'm, I'm really excited to, to dive into a bit of this. The place you start that I think is so important is, uh, you know, what is all this about? What is sex about? What is marriage about in, in God's economy? And I'm just going to throw it to you for a couple minutes to, to talk about that such important foundation. Yeah, I do think it's key. So often we dive into conversations around sexuality without asking about the bigger framework. People just want you to answer their questions about the problems that they're having. Yeah. But if you don't know what you're meant to be creating in your sexual intimacy in marriage, you really don't have the perspective to begin, begin addressing problems. And what I've learned over the last decade of ministry, and I'm sure you've learned this as well, Dr. Carol, in your work, is that most people, whether they realize it or not, are coming with a wrong framework for the purpose of sex and marriage, why God created it. And so I did start out the first few chapters just helping people discover some stories or narratives that they've brought to their understanding of yeah. sexuality that aren't helpful and aren't biblically based. And then really giving them a perspective of, actually, this is what you're supposed to be building. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's so much more to sex than just following the rules and yes. not, not sinning. 
that God actually wants us to be working towards something and growing. And so I talk a lot in the book, the whole premise of the book is that your marriage and sexual intimacy in your marriage were created to reflect how Christ loves the church, how God loves his covenant people. And that feels like such a Sunday school concept that most people don't think it applies practically to their sex life. But if you really understand it, it actually gives you a roadmap for how you can begin addressing some of the real life problems that you face in marriage. Yeah. Uh, I see that we have often made sex about behavior. And I think this is both in society at large and even in the church. And when we make it about what's on or not on the sin list, as, as you said, we miss the whole point. We miss why we're really even dealing with this. Yeah. And behavior is certainly important. The Bible yes. talks about good and bad behavior. So it's not to write that off, but behavior is meant to be the overflow of our hearts. And so um, when we think rightly, when we have a right relationship with God, when we understand his gifts rightly, then our behavior begins to align with that. And you're right, Dr. Carroll, so much of our efforts are about just changing behavior. Yeah without getting to the root of what actually causes us to, to act the way we do. Right, right. Your book takes the position, and I am so glad that you do, that God is for a great sex life in marriage. He wants you to have a great married sex life. Um, and you outline four pillars of what that's like. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're, they're so foundational and in many ways enlightening and challenging. I think it would be fruitful if, if we just kind of uh, go through what those four pillars are that you lay out. Sure. Yeah. So a word about the four pillars. First of all, I do believe that God wants us to have a great sex life. And even when we use that phrase, great sex life, what comes to your mind? Yeah. Like everybody has a definition of what that should look like. And your definition probably is incomplete. Because a great sex life, really, according to the larger teaching of the Bible, is that you begin to be more like Christ to one another, that uh, your love is being transformed, and it's truly reflecting the way that we have a relationship with God. So as we talk about these four pillars, it, you have to understand these pillars are not just something we make up. It's really looking at the nature of how God loves us and then applying it very practically to the sexual relationship. Yeah, yeah. Um, thinking about which, which is the pattern and which is the copy. Uh, sometimes I think people make, uh, you know, our marriage the pattern. And so that's supposed to tell us about something between us and God. And, and okay, we can certainly learn things there. But you're flipping that around, that uh, how Christ loves his covenant love is to be the pattern. And, mm -hmm. and we are copying that. Very true. So Christ's covenant love is the eternal thing. Yes. Uh, it existed before we existed. It will exist after we're on earth. It'll, it'll outlast your marriage for sure. <laughs> like yes. by, by eons of time. <laughs> and so uh, the copy or the metaphor is meant to yep. teach us about, about his love uh, and his love is meant to be the pattern that we strive for. It, his love is what defines what a great sex life is. Oh, that's yeah. beautiful. Which gets right to the first pillar, faithfulness. I'm reminded of the Old Testament Hebrew word hesed, loving mm -hmm. kindness, um, that is described of God. And our marriage, our married sex life is supposed to mirror that. Yeah. So like one of the statements I make in, in the book is that the most important ingredient of a good sex life is your character. And, uh, and I kind of came to that as I was wrestling through this, but most people would fill in that blank differently. Like it's your yes. body, it's your thought life, it's um, your purity, your experience, you know, all those sort of things that we've learned over time. But when we look at God's covenant relationship with us, it's all based on the fact that he is faithful, that he's yeah. trustworthy, that even when he doesn't seem to be there, we can trust his love, that he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you, and that I will always be with you. I, I don't change from day yes. to day, from generation to generation. And so we have this confidence in God in good times and in bad times 
because he is faithful and we put our stock in the fact that he is faithful. And in the same way, I think a lot of times when we talk about sex and marriage, we think faithfulness is like this special topic that it only applies to people that are recovering from a betrayal or addressing something like pornography. And certainly that is a, a huge aspect of faithfulness, but we don't realize that we all have the challenge of establishing this sense of trustworthiness and faithfulness to our word with one another. And I make the statement that you really can't build the other three pillars of a great sex life if you're not first yes. working on faithfulness. Yeah. And the way you're describing it, again, it's about character more than behavior. Behavior matters, as we've said, mm -hmm. but being faithful doesn't only mean I haven't slept with anybody but my spouse. Right. It's a lot deeper and broader than that. Yeah. Like, for example, um, you know, I just was talking to a, a couple recently and the, the man in the relationship has had uh, a longstanding struggle with pornography and he's been getting help. He's been honest about that with his wife. Yeah. And he recently um, told her, hey, I slipped again. He confessed it to her and he said, I want to get help. And she has been kind of hardening her heart throughout the years and basically just said, I'm done. Like, I, I want a divorce. I'm done with this. Like, oh. she just doesn't want to be married. Yeah. And so we look at that situation and I, at the surface level, the unfaithfulness of looking at pornography is what gets our attention. But what we don't realize is the unfaithfulness of, I'm not willing to tarry with you. Uh, I'm not willing to work with, on this with you. Like, I just, I want other things in my life. Uh, when, when we become unsafe people that way emotionally, we often don't think about it as unfaithfulness, but it is. Yes. And so faithfulness is the choice um, to always lean in, uh, you know, even through the hard times of what does it look like to be with each other through this? What does it look like to give God room to work? What does it look like for me to extend grace, even as we're setting boundaries? Uh, and so there are so many aspects of this idea of becoming like God and in, in his, as you said, that yes. steadfast love that doesn't change. And so it challenges all of us. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad faithfulness is listed as a fruit of the spirit in Galatians because we couldn't do this on our own. Uh, we, we've got to have we, we've got to have the spirit. We've got to have God's presence to to grow to that. Yeah. But let, let's talk about the the second uh, mm -hmm. pillar and mm -hmm. a word I have heard you teach on uh, many times. Yada to mm -hmm. know, and that has to do with the second pillar. So help us there. Yeah. And when I begin describing Yada, that deep knowing, you'll understand why faithfulness is so important because uh, intimacy of any kind, but particularly sexual intimacy was created to be this um, form of vulnerability. And we look at the physical vulnerability involved with sex, but there are a lot of couples who don't take it further than the physical. Mm -hmm. And the real invitation is how do I share the deepest part of myself with my spouse, including things like the sh sexual shame I brought into marriage. Yeah. How can I talk about that? Uh, can I be honest about where I'm insecure or where I struggle? Um, I, I think this is when couples can't enjoy physical sex, this is where they have an invitation to go deeper into intimacy. Mm -hmm. Like, will we just give up on this or will we press into what's happening in your heart because of whatever barrier we're facing? Yes. You know, how do we journey together through recovery from trauma or infertility or a physical limitation that takes away from our ability to enjoy each other physically? Uh, and, and so a lot of couples don't see that actually the, the deeper intimacy can come from this journeying together uh, and one way that I try to distinguish this is be, by describing the difference between sexual activity and sexual intimacy. Good. And, uh, and I think the same is true with our relationship with God. Like we can be so busy with the activity yes. that we don't even realize we have no intimacy. And so when couples are only focused on how often should we be having sex? Are we compatible? Is the sex good? They're just looking at activity instead of looking at 
hey, like over the last few years, we have journeyed through some things that have really knit our heart together. Mm. And even in the sexual arena. uh, And so that's really the invitation to go deeper into intimacy. Yeah. You touched on one of the questions I was going to to bring up. I do hear from couples, whether it's, you know, cancer treatment or uh, vaginal pain with intercourse or, you know, other various medical conditions that prevent the normal type of intercourse that we think of when we think of sex. And I love how you're talking about that doesn't have to preclude intimacy. And Mm -hmm. the goal is to pursue intimacy, to pursue knowing. Yeah, I I can see sometimes couples getting so excited when they realize that there's other ways to build intimacy. And so, for example, I remember talking to a couple that hadn't been able to have intercourse for four years. Mm -hmm. And it was a younger couple, but the combination of uh, exposure to pornography and sexual trauma and pain, like it all kind of yeah. work together to mean like, we just can't do this. Every time we try to do this, something goes wrong. And they had just given up on their sex life, but they were so frustrated by that. And mm-hmm. so uh, they were engaging with our ministry and, and I began to talk to them about what are some other ways you can be sexual with each other Yes. without having intercourse. And they just kind of looked at me like, is that even possible? Like, are we allowed to do that? <laughs> uh, and then just talking to them about learning um, to touch sexually, mm-hmm. uh, even outer course, um, yes. being able to stimulate each other without intercourse and enjoy each other that way. But also getting engaged with some sex therapy um, with somebody who could help them address some of the issues they're facing and being able to talk about triggers and working through those together. That, that is real intimacy. Yes. Uh, a couple who's willing to do those things, they're going to find that they, they even have a more intimate sex life than the couple who everything's always worked great for yeah. um, because they have to share more than their bodies. And in some ways that's more vulnerable. And I think that is actually the picture that we hear about in Genesis 2.25, the man and his wife were naked and they were not ashamed. It has that sense. It doesn't mm-hmm. spell it out we're, you know, in, in you know, longer words, but it's the sense that not only were their bodies uncovered, but their souls were uncovered too. Right, right. And, uh, and so I think when we just focus on what our bodies are doing, we don't take the invitation to actually share at a deeper level. Yeah. And for a lot of couples, they don't know how to do that. They don't even know how to talk about sex together. And so that's an important first step. Yeah. You also mentioned uh, being compatible sexually. And I heard you answer a question once when somebody asked this and you said, you will be sexually incompatible. All of us are. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was really enlightening. Talk about that for a second. Yeah, I think that there is this um, myth in the world today And I think Christians even buy it that you have to find somebody that you're sexually compatible with. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they justify living together before marriage or sleeping together before marriage. But in reality, even if you just look at male and female anatomy and our sexual response, we at some level by nature are incompatible. And even couples who would say, hey, we're usually on the same page with sexuality, it goes through seasons. Uh, You're certainly not going to be incompatible when the wife is pregnant, or or you're certainly not going to be compatible. Like her drive is going to change uh, during pregnancy and after pregnancy or seasons of stress or depression. And so I think if we go into marriage, just thinking that that's part of it. uh, And even that's part of the good gift of sex, that there's a level of incompatibility. It changes our our perspective. And some people would say, did I just hear you say that's a good thing? That yeah, we're right. <laughs> yeah. And I really do think it is because God really cares about how we love each other. Mm-hmm. And he cares that we're developing the kind of character that he has. And if a couple can have sex together and enjoy it on a regular basis without it costing them anything, They're not learning how to love. Yeah. Uh, But when it requires you to be unselfish and compassionate and empathetic, and it requires you to communicate at a deeper level, that incompatibility is is actually teaching you how to love one another. Mm -hmm. Mm. Which in some ways gets to pillar number three. 
sacrificial yes. love, yeah. one that maybe we don't like to think about, but without it, you're not going to have a good married sex life. You're not. And really without it, you don't have love. So uh, if we're talking about love the way God loves, it always is going to have an element of sacrifice. You know, Jesus said, greater love has no man than you lay your life down for your friends. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did for us. And even when we follow the Lord, the call is take up your cross and follow me, deny yourself. Yeah. And so to think that in the sexual relationship with which God created to teach us about his love, to think that there's not going to be an element of self-denial for the sake of love, sacrifice, um, you know, we're really getting this wrong. That's, that's an ingredient of love. Yes. Uh, and it's an important one to understand. It can be misunderstood. But I think this idea that we've had in Christian culture that uh, one person, usually the wife, has to be the only one to sacrifice for the needs of the other yeah. is, really, is really destructive because God created this so that both the husband and wife would be called to lay down their lives for one another and say, hey, how can I meet your needs? And not just your need for sex, how do I meet your need for, um, for touch and for empathy and for vulnerability? Uh, yeah. And so the call is so much deeper, deeper than just, okay, which one of us needs sex more? Yeah. Um, Julie, this touches on uh, perhaps two of the most common questions that people uh, come to, you know, my stuff about. I put up an article on our website a few years ago, what to do if your wife doesn't want to have sex, and then what to do if your husband doesn't want to have sex. And even a few years later, those are the most visited um, pages. I regularly uh, get husbands, and then we'll talk about wives in a second, but I regularly get husbands who will uh, write to me something like, well, 1 Corinthians 7 says my wife is supposed to give me sex and she's sinning if she's not, some variety wow. of that. Yeah. Um, unpack that for a minute for us, especially with this pillar of sacrificial love. Yeah, so I, I think we have to look at 1 Corinthians 7, those verses, um, always in context of the, yes. of the scripture and in the context of who, who Paul was writing to. Um, and he was writing to a young Corinthian church in the middle of a lot of sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. And he was answering their questions from a letter that they had sent him. And we don't have the questions. So we just have right. a one-sided conversation here. Right. But we can look at 1 Corinthians 6 and then all the way through his thoughts in 1 Corinthians 7 and say, okay, he's, he's teaching them how to think about their sexuality. Mm -hmm. And what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 is that if, you're, if you belong to Christ, your body belongs to him. It's no longer yours. You consult Christ yes. Yes. on everything you do sexually. Honor God with your body. And then he carries that thought into 1 Corinthians 7. And he says, essentially, if you're a married Christian, your body now not only belongs to God, but it belongs to one another. And so you don't have the right to just decide willy nilly, like whatever I want, I can have. You consult God, you consult your spouse, you are yes. one flesh. And then what he says, um, and, and if I could translate it, I think more effectively than what we normally does, he says, you have the obligation to minister to each other sexually. That's good. Uh, husbands, That's good. you have an obligation to minister to your wife sexually. Wives, you have an obligation to minister to your husband sexually. That's now, good. I think that's a lot better understanding than you have to meet a need. Yeah. Um, because, because needs take, first of all, like no one has, I'm going to die if I don't have sex need. Right, right. But, but sex is an important part of marriage. It's an important part of who we are as human beings. But let's take the situation where one person comes to the marriage bed with, trauma from the past and let's say again it's the woman but she every time she has sex it's emotionally painful for her it's triggering she she dissociates and then the husband says well i want to have sex four times a week whether you want it or not and essentially re-traumatizes her yeah. invoking god's name yes is that really the picture of god's covenant love it can't be 
It's uh, Julie, not. nowhere in the New Testament, nowhere in the Bible, uh, is any it, it can do we take any scripture and use it to get our own rights? Right. Uh, that's opposite of what God's kind of love is. Right. And so when you look at Ephesians chapter five, the teaching there to husbands is love your wife as you would love your own body and lay yourself down for her. And so why would the same author in a different letter say, except in the bedroom, you can have exactly. whatever you want. You know, I even challenge people to read on in first Corinthians to you get to first Corinthians 13, where yes. Paul defines love. And yes. I'll have couples say out loud with me, love is patient and then put in the bedroom. Love is kind in the bedroom. Oh, that's good. Love doesn't seek its own way in the bedroom. And all the way down, uh, love leaves all things and hopes all things. And love never fails. And I, I think, well, I don't even think I know it. When you read the whole of scripture, yes, that helps you understand that, yes, sex is very important. And we're called to minister to each other sexually. But ministry looks like, how do I love you well? Never, this is what I demand and this is my right. That is just, uh, that is just the contrary of how we see God loving us. Yeah. There's another concept that you talk about in this chapter that, frankly, I thought was encouraging and freeing. And this is more often to the wife, although this can be mm -hmm. to the husband too. And that is, if my spouse wants sex, and I'm not really into it right now. Um, what, what do I do? Do I have to want it? Do I have to be interested? And, and you talk about um, it, 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 sex as ministry. I, I, I love the way you explain this. Mm. Yeah, I, I really think there are seasons and times where one person ministers to the other sexually. And uh, there are times in marriage where it's like, okay, this is not what I was thinking of right now, mm -hmm. but this is a love gift. I love you. How do I bless you? Yeah, that is yeah. very different than I have a duty. I have an obligation. Yes. Um, so it's really yes. the heart attitude. Um, and I think a healthy sex life is when both couples have that perspective. Mm -hmm. So it could be that the one who wants to have sex says, no, no, I see you're tired. Like, I want to wait till it's a good time for you. Uh, and that's when we both have that kind of heart, we're building true intimacy and we are becoming more like Christ. And over the 28 years of marriage that Mike and I have had, we've grown in this. Like the first several years of marriage, we didn't know how to do this. We didn't have that kind of love for each other. It's yeah. had to develop over time as we've learned and as we've just grown in our relationship with the Lord. Yeah. Uh, it makes me think of the last season of life I had with my husband, who's passed away and gone home to be with the Lord. But as his illness uh, progressed and he, and he was starting to become sicker, there were periods of time when he just didn't have the physical and, you know, mm -hmm. breath where, wherewithal to engage in intercourse. And I was all concerned about, you know, managing medications and doctor's visits mm -hmm. and oxygen and so on. And then on the days when he felt better and he wanted sex, that was the last thing I had been thinking about, but mm -hmm. I learned how meaningful it was when I would take a mental step toward him. I would, I would move in that direction. My body would follow and we could enjoy beautiful intimacy, including sex mm -hmm. uh, until very shortly before he died. It was that uh, pursuing intimacy and mm -hmm. our bodies came together in the process. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful. And every season, what does that look like? Yes. And you know, there are some seasons, again, where intercourse isn't possible, but sexual intimacy is also always possible. Yes. So yes. what does it look like to have that perspective? Yes. Mm -hmm. The fourth pillar, um, mm -hmm. it should be fun. Uh, yeah. Celebration. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I was smiling as, as I uh, you know, read that and I've heard you talk about it. And just uh, unpack that for a minute. Yeah, I think we have a weird relationship with sexual pleasure in the church. Like, we're not sure if God's okay with it. And he turns his, he turns his back when you're having right. fun. Yeah. Like, oh, you shouldn't be having that much fun, but really embracing the fact that God created sex to be pleasurable. He created it. Um, he created the, the climax or the orgasm. He created the clitoris. He created the penis. He created all of it. He created dopamine, which yes. is that pleasure hormone in the brain that is released during sex. Um, but I think understanding that when we have those other three pillars in place, passionate celebration is 
is beautiful. It's safe. You, yes. you have the boundaries yes. uh, and you can enjoy each other fully. And when it's not a pleasurable season, you still have reason to say sex is good, even though today it didn't feel great. Uh, the bigger picture is good. And again, I think we have to keep remembering the parallel of God's love for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and people are like, what does sexual passion and pleasure have to do with God's love for us? Yeah. Well, what would it be like if in our relationship with God, we had these other three pillars, we were faithful to him, uh, we were growing in intimacy with him, we were laying down our lives for him, we were sacrificing for God, but there was no joy. Yes. What if we never worshiped? Yes. You know, what if every church service you went to, it just started right with a sermon? What would be lacking? You Throughout the scripture, we're told, over and over to rejoice in the Lord, to celebrate, to rejoice always. Uh, it's a huge part of our relationship with God. And the same is true in your marriage, that God has said there, you should take time out regularly to rejoice in your love, to enjoy each other to the fullest. And your marriage doesn't have to be perfect for that to happen. You can treat sex like a sanctuary, like all of our problems are here. We're just going to leave them there for a little while Beautiful. and just enjoy each other and enjoy the gift of sex. And then our problems will be waiting for us to fix when we get back. But that's what we do in our relationship with God. You know, every morning we should be worshiping him. Every yes. weekend we should be gathering as his bride to just sing our love out to him. And that regular pattern is something that's healthy in marriage as well. Mm, beautiful. Beautiful. It makes my heart sing just to hear yeah. you talk about that. I am sure that there are couples listening to us or watching us, and this isn't what their married sex life looks like at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe there, you know, there, there's some desire there, but they're, they're really wondering, is, is there any hope for us? Talk about that for a minute. Yeah, absolutely. There's hope. And the great thing about these pillars is that we can always be moving towards them. Mm -hmm. And no one has a, this perfect, like no one has the marriage that is perfect in all of these four pillars. It's a journey of, of maturation and of learning. And so just the fact that you're listening to this or watching this means that you're taking steps towards building a great sex life uh, because you're investing. And so my encouragement would be just keep asking God, what's my next step? Like, don't look around at other couples and compare yourself to them. Look at where you were a year ago mm -hmm. and the progress you've made and continue to invite God into this so that he can give you the wisdom and the help that you need to continue to grow. Yeah. You mentioned a couple minutes ago about sexual trauma and that may look like, you know, uh, pursuing this may look like okay, I have some trauma to deal with so that I can um, mm -hmm. pursue intimacy more directly. That may be part of exactly the process. Absolutely. I, I say for some couples, they need to stop being sexually active for a season so that they can become sexually intimate. Mm. And that's one example of when, when you're like, hey, let's just press pause and get the kind of help that we need so that our sexual interactions don't continue to feel wounding. Uh, and so couples or individuals that are, are working on trauma, working on things from their past, you're making progress, even if physically it doesn't look that way. Mm, that's great. That's great. Um, Julie, you reference in the book that as you were preparing some of this material, you were talking with some couples about this. And I know you've got some wonderful response uh, since the book has been out just a, a few weeks and, and hearing from people who've been impacted by it. And as we close, can, can you maybe just give us a, a vignette or two, just situations where this message has helped change people's married sex life? Yeah, you know, one, one couple that comes to mind is a couple that was in one of our pilot studies. And the man had all kinds of history with pornography since the time that he was little and had been trying to battle that. Uh, the woman had her own issues that she was trying to deal with. And the man just said in the group, like, it was like an aha moment. He's like, I feel so free because I've never understood sex apart from the act. 
Yes. And now I know what it is. Like, I want to be known by my wife like that. I mm-hmm. see how shallow pornography is. And it was like a whole new motivation um, for him to work on this with his wife and understand why she was wanting to communicate. And he, and he just said, no one's ever taught me that I need intimacy. Yes. I've just always thought all I needed was a sexual release. Uh, wow. and, and so that, that's an example of one couple uh, you know, another couple, we actually, I interviewed one, a couple on the podcast job with Julie a few weeks ago that shared their story. And this is a pastor and his wife who both have had a history of difficulty. He had been molested as a child and had a struggle with pornography. She had sexual pain, a lot of shame around that. And they just kept trying to work on this, but they didn't have a roadmap of what that looked like. And this is really giving them a roadmap of how we pursue healing and how we grow together instead of blaming each other. Uh, And it's just really exciting to see what God is doing. And I can't emphasize enough that this is a journey. Yes, This this is not a one and done, read a book, listen to a podcast and things are great, but it gives you a roadmap of where you need to be headed on that journey. And I think that's where so many couples feel stuck. Mm. That's beautiful. Uh, God, sex in your marriage, Dr. Julie Slattery. What a pleasure, a delight. Uh, thank you. Uh, we've we could go. I know uh, a, a lot longer, but I am just so um, I'm so encouraged, enriched uh, with this understanding. I know this message is blessing many, and I pray uh, it continues to. And may God bless you as you continue authentic intimacy. Well, thank you. Always a joy to be with you, Dr. Carol. I would encourage you to listen to Java with Julie, uh, her podcast. I would encourage you to get God, Sex, and Your Marriage. We'll have links to that under this video. We'll also have links to the articles I referenced uh, from our website, what to do if your wife doesn't want to have sex, what to do if your husband doesn't want to have sex. I, I think you will find that encouraging in helping you move forward with putting these principles and these pillars uh, into practice in your life, first in your own heart and in your marriage. I'd love to hear from you anytime. Uh, You can use the uh, comments below and I would love to hear from you there. If you'd like to leave a confidential comment, you can use the contact page on our website. That comes to me, it's confidential and I respond personally. Make sure to uh, subscribe to this channel if uh, you're enjoying anything you hear there so we can keep in touch with you and you can see each new episode. We usually put up a new conversation uh, once a week or so and we'd love to keep in touch with you that way. And until next time, may God bless you.